Thank you very much, Professor. Um, my name is Dr. Simon Roth, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you all on behalf of the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy, CISD, um, of which Omar is a graduate and which I've worked for the last three years establishing um, the MA module in Sport and Diplomacy. I'm going to introduce our panellists, and then we'll get uh, cracking uh, with the event this evening. Um, first of all, uh, Rima Akhtar. Uh, Almost needs no introduction, but since I've, Miriam kindly printed it off and I've got it written down here, I'll do you the justice of going through it. The first Muslim women, and one of only six women in total, to sit on the FA Council, uh, the Football Association Council, uh, major governing body of the British Association. Chair of the Muslim Women's Sports Foundation, no little task in itself, and worked with the female uh, Olympic uh, London 2012 Olympic bid too. Um, also runs a diversity consultancy and co-founding the Listening Service, a non-profit which provides women with culturally sensitive advice and support. I won't hold this against Rimmer, but she's a Liverpool <coughs> fan, as I read here, and has both coached and played football to a high level. Next to her, Imran Azam, co-founder and trustee of the uh, Association of Muslim Footballers. Um, he's a founder uh, of this is Real.co, a smartphone only digital storytelling consultancy, and the media director at the Sharing Economy Advocacy Group, the people who share.com. With these two and Omar, who is almost needs no introduction, but um, as his PhD supervisor, I probably should um, give him a little chance to lord it up before I start grilling him, or rather, you start grilling him. Omar, uh, a graduate of CISD, and now a member of the Center for Inter uh, Islamic Studies. Um, he's doing very important work, and I really do stress this without sort of making his head too large to fill out the door. Really important work on the way that British uh, football deals with uh, Muslim identity. And I think it's the confluence of these different identities, and I use that term deliberately, that's really important that draws out of uh, Omar's work. I won't do anything more than that, because you're the people here to ask the questions. So without any further ado, we shall begin... Uh, asking the questions. Miriam is going to be our social media darling this evening, um, tweeting away. My battery's run out, so I'm going to be resolved on the old bit of paper. Hi, Simon. Good to know. <laughs> OK. OK. So without any further ado, we begin by asking our uh, audience to just begin getting the uh, brain uh, flowing, get your questions posed. Miriam. Yeah, so um, we've got some really good questions from the CISD Sports and Diplomacy MA students. Um, I was trying to think up some clever questions, but they've done all the hard work for me, so this is great. Um, I'm sorry that I can't attribute credit for these questions, so I don't know who asked them, but well done. Uh, the first one is, do you think it's fair to the whole panel that athletes are branded as Muslim players and that their faith is a part of their football identity when that isn't the case for footballers of different faiths? And just a reminder of that hashtag, folks. That's a hashtag SOASFMD. Rimla, I think you should kick off. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think uh, it's just to, that question is it's, it's quite an interesting one because certainly if you look at, uh, if you just take women's sport, for example, um, you know, oftentimes female athletes will always talk about the fact that they want to just be seen as athletes and they don't want the female part to, to really come into it. But, but oftentimes, I mean, that, that's the identity that people see. Um, I think, personally, in everything that I do in diversity and inclusion within sport, I am ultimately, I don't want to be seen as an Asian woman or a Muslim woman doing what I do, but ultimately I recognise that that's a part of, it's an inevitable part of what I do because we're such a rare species <laughs> that it's, um, it's, it's inevitable. So I think, from my perspective, I actually think that a lot of um, Muslim athletes embrace their Muslimness, um, and they do a really good job of, um, of, of putting that out there in, in a positive way, encountering any other narratives. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I mean, Muslims are pretty much flavor of the month at the moment, right? You might have noticed. Um, every month. Every month. And, um, you know, it's really a personal decision for for these professional sports people to take as to where they, you know, how they live their faith, whether it's publicly or privately. I think there is a perception, uh, if they do anything remotely Islamic, that 
you know, they identified as Muslim relatively quickly. Um, and people like to jump on that, both Muslim and non-Muslim, both for positive reasons and negative reasons. And sports people in general, especially footballers in our experience, are, are quite shy to, to show parts of their life. You know, they just want to be seen as players, not to be treated really any differently. But ultimately, if they were to do something in a game which indicates that they are Muslim, then they are picked on for it, or it is promoted for that purpose. Um, so, for example, if we look at Mesut Ozil, right? This isn't somebody who overtly shouts from the rooftops that he, he is of the Islamic faith. But it's clear if you watch him pre-game, he'll be making a prayer, okay? Now, he has explained this, and he's felt he's had to explain this because he's being asked about it. But actually, for him, it's a very private moment. And when he's asked about what he's praying for, he's saying he's praying for his teammates, which is quite interesting. Whereas, you know, should he really need to explain that? I mean, it's, there's no right or wrong answer to this. Um, and it is down to the individual. But there it does seem to be a special onus or an expectation that Muslim players represent the faith. And that's not always fair. Um, it's a, yeah, interesting question, and I think given the fact that we have to also take into account the current political, and social, and economic climate, um, if we were to judge Muslim players as solely as athletes and participants within, within sporting competitions, I think it would be quite unfair to give them the label that they are Muslim. At the end of the day, they wouldn't be where they are if they're not talented sports people. So. A lot of it comes down to the fact that they're able to compete at, at the top level. Um, and in, in my case, in my research, where I've interviewed um, top elite sports people in the Premier League, um, you have many of them actually who say, at the end of the day, um, I want to be seen as a professional elite football player and without the, the Muslim tagline. I mean, if that would, if I assume that position because of the current climate and the Muslims are constantly in the news, and I have an obligation or a duty to actually um, represent the faith in, a, in, a, in, a, in the best of manners, both on and off the field, both in front of the camera and, uh, and away from the camera in their personal lives, then they will be happily to, to, you know, happy to take that um, uh, responsibility on board. But again, I think it's very important that we don't see, um, for instance, David Beckham being referred to as a Christian football player. We refer to him as number seven, Manchester United, um, ex-England international, ex-England captain, but not anything to do uh, with his faith. And that goes with many other players who may be from the Rastafarian faith or from the Buddhist faith. Um, I believe it's Mario Baggio, for instance, who is of the Buddhist faith. Not many people know that. Um, why doesn't Mario Baggio, why is he not on the front pages and people are talking about the fact that he is a Buddhist as well? So I think what, what is personal only becomes public in the public domain, like Imran mentioned, the case of Ozo and many other Muslim football players, uh, both in the UK and abroad, where we see the act of personal um, symbolic uh, actions are made in, in public. And this is where it is important and quite significant where the, 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 the label of Muslimness comes into play. And how does that actually interact within the context of sport and also uh, the context of, of, like I mentioned, social, political and economic? Can you just follow up on that and say how much, talking to the panel here, how much of those identities are prescribed and how much of them are adopted um, by the sportsmen and women that you're talking about here? Is, is this something that one is forced to embrace because it's constantly the moniker that comes with a another, you know, Mesut Ozil Muslim footballer rather than Mesut Ozil World Cup winner, Mesut Ozil, you know, what is the, the sort of hashtag, so to speak, ascribed to these things? to these individuals, or indeed to particular sports that have you know, uh, cultural um, or religious uh, qualifiers. Because what I'm driving at here, I suppose, is, is the, the sort of different and multiple le um, conflicting levels of identity that are at work. So, you know, your gender, your age, your religion, these are all factors that come into what is it that sort of trumps and it becomes a Muslim footballer rather than a left winger. You know, your, your talent that's well, driven the... Well, it, 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 from our experience at the AMF, you know, it doesn't take much for somebody to be labelled as a Muslim footballer rather than simply a footballer. It doesn't really take much. And that's, 
I'd say it's on. Well, I was about to say it's, um, it's both from Muslims and, and non-Muslims. So, you know, we found, I mean, if you follow uh, at the AMF on Twitter, if you, if you want to do that, feel free. Um, you know, we've got about 33,000 um, followers on there. And, you know, we don't do anything highly intellectual with that following because we're simply there to inspire young people through our account. And so if we see a player that's perhaps like Emre Chan, for example, but another Liverpool fan, by the way, over here. Um, <laughs> if we see Emre Chan on the sidelines, you know, making a prayer, and there's a good picture of that, then we'll tweet it, and we'll find it's very, very popular. So, you know, we as an organization, we push, push out uh, this image. But also, uh, if there is, uh, you know, it will be noticed, and it will be picked up, sometimes subconsciously and consciously, that a player has done something that labels him as a Muslim. And it's kind of like Muslims are given a, a special treatment as opposed to any other faith at this moment in time because of all the other kind of socio-political stuff that surrounds, uh, surrounds the faith. So to answer your question, it's both from uh, within the Muslim community and from you know, the mainstream community, the non-Muslim community and the media uh, as well. I think just to add to that, um I'm actually quite a firm believer in athlete activism. So um, whilst I agree that it's an individual's choice to, um, you know, whether, whether that's a private moment or whether it's, it's a public moment, that's that individual's choice. And we shouldn't be you know, looking at or judging them in any particular way because of those choices. I still think that it's really important, particularly given the climate right now, um, that athletes do become activists. I mean, in America, Everyone must have heard about the Black Lives Matter campaign. Um, and a lot of athletes from the NBA, for example, have come out and you know, spoken about that um, quite publicly. We've seen the T-shirts, we've seen the tweets, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, etc., coming out really publicly. But one of the first ever athlete, well, the first athlete activist of this particular campaign was a woman who doesn't get the same kind of publicity, obviously, as, as LeBron and Kobe, but she was, her name's Ariana Smith, and she was playing um, a game, a basketball, college basketball game in Missouri, which is the same state as, obviously, when Michael Brown was, was uh, killed in, in Ferguson. And he wasn't, uh, she wasn't playing too far away from actually where the incident took place. And she decided that she had to do something. So on college basketball game day, she went along with her team. They, they lined up, uh, ready to play. The national anthem's going off, the American flag's in front, front of them all you know, it's how patriotic are the Americans, you know, that you don't disrupt the anthem. She decided, and it's now an infamous moment to, to do something, and she stood, she stepped forward from that line of her teammates, and she put her hands up in the hands up, don't shoot, you know, gesture, which is now iconic. She stepped forward to the American flag, and she just lay on the floor. She just went onto the floor, and everyone's wondering what's going on, like she hadn't told anyone what she was gonna do. She lay there for four and a half minutes. Four and a half minutes. She didn't move. Everyone's coming up to her, asking her, you know, is everything okay, Ariana? You know, what's going on? The game couldn't start. After four and a half minutes, she got up. She stayed there that long because that's how long it took for Michael Brown's body to be moved after he'd been killed. And that was her statement. She became an activist that day. She used her, you know, field of play, whatever it is, she used that as a moment to, to make a statement. And she walk, walked off you know, with the black power salute kind of walking off. That's the kind of stuff that, you know, you can't get away from that image in itself of, of someone doing that in front of you. That really hits you. And I think what athletes decide to do, Muslim or non-Muslim, like I say, is a personal choice, but ultimately it can have such a huge impact. We've got to use that power positively. That was actually, connected to one of the questions that I had, which was about the limitations then that are placed on Muslim footballers in seeking to operate in the realm of diplomacy, because, um, forgive the question, but would this have any implications for her career? Would it have any implications for her ability to speak out and represent, you know, brands? I mean, these are all things that would affect her livelihood, right, as a professional sportswoman. Yeah, I think, I mean, in her particular case, obviously, college basketball comes uh, with wim the women's NBA, it comes just below the women's NBA. 
um, and she was she is a very good player. Uh, she's seen both the the benefits, the blessings, as well as the burdens of becoming an athlete activist. But actually, you know, people have rallied around her. People that have even a you know bigger kind of say in what goes on in the sports field, the likes of Kobe and LeBron, as I say, those kind of people have come around and supported her in that. So it is a difficult. Nobody's saying it's easy. You know, it, it does have an impact, and I think. You know, we were saying earlier on that clubs have a lot of, of say in what their players do. And, you know, you all know Adnan as well, like in terms of, you know, the, the pressures that, that footballers are under all the time. You know, even the hijab ban that came in through FIFA, um, it was not just about religious headgear. It was about political statements. You can't make political statements on the field of play. So there's all sorts of restrictions. But I think that we should, wherever possible, try and kind of maneuver around those restrictions to, to really put out a positive message because it's needed. No, just to add to that. So, I mean, just just on that last point, in terms of doing what you can, um, are we do have any Egyptians here. Mm. Just the one. Marhaba. <laughs> um, the reason I ask is, um, so I try and keep this short. Really, it's quite a long story. So, as part of the AMF, uh, we get a lot of interest from organisations in the Gulf, and on a couple of occasions. Uh, we've been asked to put together a team and take them out to Saudi Arabia to perform the pilgrimage, the minor pilgrimage, the Umrah, and also to play a game. Um, and only about seven or eight months ago, uh, we, I mean, a couple of years ago, we played a game in Mecca, in Mecca, and, um, and this time we, had, we were asked to play in Medina, not me personally, I would have gladly played, but uh, the, the other guys. And um, there's a player that you'll hopefully, I think, be aware of called Abu Thrika, right? He's, he's a tremendously famous guy in Egypt. Not many people, well, many people do know him in Europe, but in Egypt he is a hero. And he's seen as an activist. The problem for people like Abu Thrika is that they're seen as political activists. And that's potentially quite dangerous for them as individuals. So they have to be very, very careful as to how they tread this line. Uh, between standing up for particular things and putting their own personal safety at risk. Um, and you know, and the, the thing is, these guys are tremendously popular. They're doing tremendously non-political good work with young people, with society in general, both at home and abroad. I mean, there's somebody who won, I think, the African Player of the Year three times in a row. Um, and it, we were with him. You know, I, I had to rescue him a few times outside the main major mosque in Medina, where he was absolutely mobbed. And when I say mobbed, it's like you haven't seen this kind of mobbing before outside kind of like a very sacred place. So he's trying to get to the mosque to try and pray. And somebody spots him, another person spots him, and then suddenly there's a big crowd uh, to basically physically try and release him from this. And then after, the, after we'd, you know, we'd all gone home, within a month we're reading in the papers that, um, you know, that his his assets have been frozen, um, and that there are restrictions that have been placed on him. So when it comes to putting yourself out there, it really depends who you are, where you are um, as well. And so it's, it's that last point that you made is to the degree that you can without actually suffering some pretty serious consequences. I think if we're looking at that in a broader context of, of sports men and women as activists. Is there something particular about uh, the Islamic faith or Muslim uh, that we sit here today in the 21st century that makes it such a um, particular issue? Or is it just that we're in, you know, the society we live in broadly has identified Muslim as, you know, for all of the rights and wrong reasons that we could have a whole other class about, that's the main identifier? Because sportsmen, the activists, is, you know, have a long tradition. You know, it's not a new phenomenon having sportsmen, men and women, really, uh, as activists. Is there something about this utilising the Islamic faith that can bring that real positive advantage to both the individual, its immediate you know, audience of a development programme or a humanitarian effort or a, a philanthropic endeavour? Or is it actually something that we're... Um, you know, just trying to caricature as a Western media, um, you know, on the other end of the spectrum. Just to get some sense of um, perspective in this. 
Can I maybe, uh, I want to, I want to go back to um, the, um, I will answer your question, Simon. No, I'm not Sorry, trying to. eventually you have to. Yeah. Uh, but with regards, to, anyway. with regards to representation, I think that's very, very important because as an individual, when you are in the public domain, um, you are represented and you are representing. So there's a difference here. What I mean by that is you are either representing the, the Muslim community or the sporting community, but in the media you're represented um, as um, a multiple of identities. So I think there needs to be a, a clarification here in terms of where you're appropriated. So as a, for instance, let's take um, the case of uh, Moeen Ali. So Moeen Ali is an English cricketer, plays for England, uh, has a, you know, uh, evidently a very significantly large beard, which you know one can miss. Um, but how do we refer to him? And it's interesting to pick up the commentary when we, when we refer to Moeen Ali. And what I mean by this is there are many, many cases here where Muslim sports uh, people, both men and women, are put in a position where uh, Mesut Ozil is of Turkish descent. He's a German international, but when he's not playing well, for instance, he's of Turkish descent. But when he's winning the World Cup and he's lifting the World Cup trophy, this is a great sign of integration. You know, we have a Turkish uh, migrant who settled in Germany and has got a World Cup gold medal. Perfect. And you could pretty much maybe, uh, you know, uh, put forward the same argument here in England. You could say, well, the, the answer to Muslim integration or success of Muslim integration is to have a number 10 England captain who's Muslim and lifts, lifts a trophy. Um, and actually, single-handedly, Messi-esque wins the, wins the, wins the trophy for, for England. But I think... With, going back to your, your, your question, Simon, with regards to Islam and um, its, its, uh, its uh, influence or its capacity, so to speak, social capacity, um, I think individuals, um, Muslim sports people, have two key um, responsibilities. We're talking about here, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think in this, in this regard, um, you know, you couldn't say otherwise. And I think they play as bridge builders with the non-Muslim community, but also play a role as ambassadors for the Muslim community. And I think is, here, is, here is the important uh, correlation or relationship we have. So to the non-Muslim audience, what does, what, I, mean, what, I mean, how do they perceive Dembabar, for instance? And we've, we've seen the case in Newcastle, we've had 45, 50,000 50, fans chanting um, for Dembabar, a Ramadan song, uh, so he clearly is, you know, up in Newcastle where, you know, not, not too long ago we had in the northeast a strong contingent for, for UKIP voters. We have a, a massive, massive group of fans who take to the streets, counter Peggy the uh, marches. So we're seeing here the political um, um, you know, um, influence as well, where we're seeing fans coming out and seeing this bridge building played by Dembabas merely by scoring goals and prostrating on the ground. At the same time, Dembabar plays the role of ambassador. There are many, many Muslims who follow him on Twitter who take much pride in, in what Dembabar says and does, both on and off the field. To the extent that in Daily Sabah, it was reported that he, he has, someone tweeted Dembabar and said, could you please wake me up for Fajr, the morning prayer? And he actually did. So he said, I, I will do that. Right. So you, you, you actually literally have this intimate relationship where, you know, as a leader of, the, of, of your community, I should go around, be knocking on people's doors and waking them up for the morning prayer as well as being a professional elite football player and winning medals and trophies around the globe. So I think there's a, there's a twofold to, to that question. Obviously, I will say that because, you know, being, being in an academic world, there's always going to be a nuanced argument. But genuinely, within this case, there is definitely a, a sense of bridge building and also representation. But when, when that player does, an, for example, an act of frustration on the pitch, is that individual consciously making an act of resistance, like what we're talking about, with Ariana, which was a very conscious act of resistance, which was thought through, like she thought through the whole four and a half minutes, and it was clear she was making a political statement. Isn't it the difference with Muslim footballers is they just happen to be doing what Muslims do, but because of the political climate, there's far more significance attributed to it than it actually has even for them. Mm. Uh, just say that I think the reaction to that, uh, to what a Muslim player does, says more about the person reacting rather than the player who's performing, you know. So, like you see a player like Mohamed Besic, you know, for Everton. You know, recently, I mean, you know, he made quite a. He did a first. I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen this. Uh, normally, players score goals and then they make sujood. 
he was a substitute and he was coming on the pitch and he did us the truth. You know, he did a prostration before and it was quite, you know, everyone's there watching him, waiting to come on. Um, and how people react to that says, says more about them, really. I mean, you can, how can you really interpret what that is? I mean, if you look at the States with the college football, you know, you, you know God plays a more significant role in kind of political public life in America. Um, so when you get a player crossing themselves or doing something overtly Christian, it's just, you know, it's accepted. Whereas I, th I can't remember the name of the player, so maybe somebody can help me out, but um, a player, an American football player who's Muslim, performed the, the prostration, and it was a huge issue. I think Fox, I think, yeah, I think Fox News had, it's, you know, it's filled for a week with that. Um, so, you know, it depends who's watching and how they interpret it and how they want to interpret it. I think just to add to what Omar and Moran have said, it's it's also um, you know ultimately from from my perspective, you can't change what, what how something's going to be covered. I remember I was attending a workshop. This is a couple of years ago. Um, we oh, my timelines are kind of skewed here, but we had the Woolwich, obviously the, the murders in, in the murder in Woolwich, and um, they were it was soon after that, and they were showing that the pages, the headlines, the of um, they had Mo Farah, and they had the Woolwich murderers, um, and. That was that. Those were the two pictures that were used in the same paper, and when it came to the murders, obviously it was Muslim everywhere. But when it came to Mo Farah, there was nothing relating to to his faith, and that's ultimately an example of you know people will choose how they want to represent something and what they want to home in on. Um, you know the whole the concept of Muslims in sport and and what that means is it's nothing new. You know I remember growing up. You know when Mida was at Middlesbrough and you know he had to deal with the bomber chants. You know this was probably a decade ago, um, you know, as the Muslim Women's Sport Foundation's grown over the years, as soon as, you know, anyone heard anything about Muslim women, first of all, it was like, you know, suddenly a light bulb would, you know, particularly in the news, you know, light bulb would, would hit and they'd, they'd want to just suddenly, you know, just want to know what you're going to do and they were just so inter interested in what you're doing because it's Muslim and women, women and then you add in sport and they're just like, whoa, you know, like, do Muslim women even play sport? Do they want to play sport? Aren't they stopped from playing sport? They're not allowed to play sport, are they? You know, all of those kind of questions. And this is from a decade ago, so it's nothing new. Um, and I think that ultimately, you know, we see a lot of um, a lot of uh, exposure of obviously Muslim, Muslim male athletes. Um, in the UK, we don't have as many Muslim female athletes. Um, but we do have a number abroad. And actually, what you see with those uh, women the likes of Ibtihaj Muhammad, who's in America, the number two US Sabre fencer, consistent gold medalist, who talks about you know, the fact that she, she came to our awards, which was at Wembley Stadium a few years back, um, and she won our International Sportswoman of the Year, and she spoke about the fact that she decided not only to take up fencing as her sport because she was passionate about it, but also because it allowed her to still keep covered. And that was really important for her. Um, but then she speaks out really publicly. Um, you know, she has a T-shirt which says everything's better in hijab. You know, for her, that's, that's the message that she wants to give. Um, so I think when it comes to female Muslim athletes, particularly the ones that wear hijab, they're almost forced into being activists because all anyone's interested in is the fact that they've got a hijab around them. Um, and so whether they want to or not, they're out there publicly representing Islam. And I think actually um, those international female athletes have, have taken on that, that role really positively and done some great stuff with it. Thinking about um, that role that you know, people can adopt or have it portrayed, uh, portrayed um, sort of prescribed to them, we think about one of the questions that you know, one of our students has asked here about perhaps the, the most, you know, to speak to the fact that this has been going on a long time, is Muhammad Ali as a representative of a Muslim faith and someone who really did take the stance to injure their sporting career at the height of wor in, uh, world heavyweight champion, renounced that um, by virtue of being drafted by in a government structure, took that opportunity to make a statement about their faith, which cost, you know, not was, wasn't, you know, had a real detrimental effect on that particular career at that point. The story of redemption afterwards is what you know the, 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 the quality that sport gives you as a narrative. But to what extent does that speak to the fact that sports and politics have always mixed, and that we are current focus and indeed our focus this evening is 
on a particular religion's affiliation or association with sport. But actually, these are such long-standing long, long standing issues that, you know, in a, you know, five years' time, we could be talking about LGBT issues, diplomacy in sport, or those kind of, you know, it's just another uh, identifier. And what makes sport and politics, you know, so integrated, despite the fact that so many sports federations will tell you there's n we have nothing to do with politics. We're purely interested in the, in the game and the spectacle and all those kind of... How do you reconcile that in your mind? Um, sport is politics. And politics is sport. Um, I mean, if you look at the history of, 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 of nation states, even if you just take, for example, the, the IOC now, the International Olympic Committee, there are more nations recognized by the International Olympic Committee than the United Nations. So bear that in mind. Um, so you now you see FIFA, you see the IOC, you see IAAF. Um, you know, these are, are, are massive governing bodies which are almost much more powerful than, than, than nation states. Um, and they arguably have much more, you know, bigger, bigger budget. And if you wanted to assess their GDP per, per staff personnel, I'm sure it would be much larger than many, many countries across the globe. So the, the political influence they have, these governing bodies, is immense. Is immense, and that, and, that, and that plays a significant role with regards to uh, business, with media, um, uh, which obviously we're talking about today, and um, and the role of. I mean, I think this was last week where you had Adidas pull out from a sponsorship deal with um, IAAF uh, because of the doping scandal, and that really harms uh, the, the 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 governing body. So if you look at in that case, particularly the idea of representation, do I want to associate myself with this with this governing body? Um, and you have a lot of, I mean, it's quite interesting, there's an interesting correlation, I was speaking about this with my students uh, uh, last week about um, the role of BRIC nations and hosting, and hosting mega events. It's quite interesting that you actually look at the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, they've all hosted mega events, sporting mega events. So the idea that to be a developed nation, you must host a mega event. So that's part of a checklist criteria. So you're not a developed nation unless you've ticked the, uh, the, the, the sporting mega event list. Obviously, we know in the case of Brazil, they'll be hosting the Olympics this year, hosted the World Cup two years ago. Russia will be hosting, or have hosted Sochi Olympics, will be hosting the World Cup in 2018. Uh, after that, you have uh, India who hosts, I mean, they have the, um, uh, the Indian Premier League. So arguably that is a sporting mega event, the, the multi-million pound industry. You have China who've hosted Beijing, and not too long ago, there was a state visit from China to the UK to develop football in China because they want to host the World Cup in China. And if I'm not mistaken, the UK, the British government has invested three million pounds in that, in that deal, which is very, very interesting to see the behind the scenes. They visited Manchester City Football Club. They're talking about bringing exporting football, the, the British game, the English game to the world. So the idea that it goes beyond the fact it's just only a sporting game, you're, you're a healthy competition, it's actually a form of, 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 of cultural imperialism, if you will. Um, and, and I refer back to Pierre de Coubertin, who's the founder, or allegedly the founding father of the Olympic Committee, who if you look at his political memoirs, he was a supporter of the new fascist Nazi regime. But he was heavily, heavily interested in exporting this, this ideal, this Eurocentric ideal of sport and sporting competitions at different parts of the globe. So I think I mean, that's only one example, but there are many examples where you see politics and sports are heavily, heavily influenced by each other. Abu Trika is one of them, which has been mentioned this evening. Mm -hmm. You know, Abu Trika wouldn't have been in prison if he had not, uh, if he wasn't vocal uh, against the um, Mubarak regime. If uh, the Al Ahli Ultras, you know, they rallied in Tahrir Square, I was there back in 2011. Um, and also, you have cases where Abu Trika, who lifts his shirt, you know, I love Palestine, free Palestine, same with Canute, and they face repercussions. But it's important in these cases, they, they did not face repercussions because of the political message. In these cases, they were faced um, you know, fines and, and, and some, in some cases, bans with regards to the sponsorship deals. So obviously, as a sponsor, I have airtime so on, on camera. So if I lift the shirt off, that's why players will get a yellow card if they take their shirt off, because it means the airtime on that individual is not given it its, 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 its full right for the, sponsor, for, for the sponsor. However, there are political repercussions. For instance, in the case of Abu Treka, yes, he gets, he gets a yellow card, which is standard for any player, but then he gets um, uh, chased after, assets frozen, um, uh, in, in, within the um, political consequence. 
and even Muhammad Ali as well. I mean, I think it's, it's, um, it's only fair to say that Muhammad Ali, we can't, I mean, we as Muslim, the Muslim community can't take full credit for what Muhammad Ali stood for. And it's very important to, 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 to make this clear because if we have a Muhammad Ali lecture, you would see people of the Islamic faith and the non-Muslim faith, people of, of the social movement, which, which, was, which was massive, the black social movement, the political um, um, stance that he took was very, very important. Before, I believe, his faith. I would argue his social stance and political stance played a much more significant role than his actual Islamic faith with regards to galvanizing people and resisting against the government. Obviously, his, 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 um, his stance on, the, on getting drafted, drafted into Vietnam was one, and the, uh, and the black movement in, in America. So if his faith played a role in actually living up to such principles, than by all means. And I think this is where Islam played a significant role for, for Muhammad Ali, is the fact that these principles that he lived by, irrespective of the repercussions, they're universal principles we believe in, you know, um, equality, human rights, dignity, for, for, uh, dignity and empowerment for the individual. So they all play a significant role. So I think, you know, in short, sport is politics and politics is sport. Should we start with the last one? <laughs> Is that all right? So you're addressing that question to me? So just, just be a bit more specific. Is there an opportunity for Muslim players to finance organizations like ours? Right, yeah, we actually have one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's one we made earlier. <laughs> Um, many of you probably don't know what the Association of Muslim Footballers is, right? No? no? <laughs> Couple. Okay. Knows everything, <laughs> Very briefly, in 2012, we set up the organization in order to act as a point of contact for all stakeholders in the game. So it's not a representative body for players. It's not like an alternative Muslim version of the PFA. So, for example, over these years, I mean, we, we have virtually zero funding, right? And we do not ask players for funding as a principle, right? Um, so we'll get the media getting in touch with us when they require clarification of a story. We've had the PFA get in touch with us in order to understand the issues around a specific player. Some of you may remember Pape Sise, who was refusing to wear the betting uh, Wonga sponsorship on his shirt. Um, so the PFA would speak to us in order to understand the issue better. Um, so whether you're fans, whether you're a club, a regulatory body, whether you're the media, um, we simply act as a point of contact in order to provide some clarification. And in terms of our public facing side, of the, all of that stuff happens like you know, cloak and dagger underneath, you know, everything, you know, in the background. But all you'll see from us on our Twitter is really the promotion of some of the actions, some of the stories from Muslim players around the world, which simply inspire. That's what they are. In order to answer your question, um, uh, yes, players do get involved. But we have to be quite careful in how much we ask of, of players. There's a perception out there, and I'm sure Adelan will confirm this, that players have loads of time on their hands, that they, you know, they don't really know what to do with it. Um, and they have no commitments. It's like a holiday. It's the exact opposite. They have huge commitments. It's very, very difficult to lead uh, a normal life as well. And it's actually very, very difficult for, for the players to generally trust people too because there's constantly people coming out of the woodwork saying, can you do this and can you do that and can you do this? And as a Muslim player, I think there's a feeling that you generally have to be a little bit more careful about who you're saying yes to. So yes, there is an opportunity for players to get involved, and we try and push them as much as we can to get involved, but we're also respectful of their, their time. And uh, we, you know, we, as, as, as a principle, we do not accept money uh, from players. I'm going to go backwards as well, um, because my memory's going to fail me probably. <laughs> but um, yeah, I know. Um, the question about Muslim women and the difficulties um, in, in the UK, obviously um, across sort of the Arab world, Middle East, um, and, and further east, um, the, the issues are interconnected, the political issues as well as um, kind of in a sports situation as well. But here in the UK, you know, the vast majority is attitudinal 
um, attitudinal both in the community as well as in the industry as well. Um, so we can't hide from the fact that within the community, um, you know, and it's not just the Muslim community, we, we are aware of that. It's, it's a lot of um, communities that feel very negatively about women taking part in sport, um, particularly taking it as a career even. Um, but I think that's changing. Um, you know, even if you look at all the surveys that are done just for all women in sport, not just not just Muslim women or minority uh, community women, you know, one of the, the biggest issues that women have when it comes to playing sport, for example, is they don't want to sweat. They don't want to sweat in front of people. They don't want to, um, you know, show off their body in front of people and all that kind of stuff. There's, there's generally with women, there's, there's, there's that kind of um, fear that they have when it comes to sport. Um, that is changing. We've seen the This Girl Can campaign in the uh, in in England, um, although the diversity within that was quite frankly rubbish. Um, but when it comes to Muslim women in the industry itself, there's just a huge lack of understanding of the needs of this community. It's amazing that the Muslim Women Sport Foundation has been going for 15 years, 16 almost, and we are still dealing with the same issues. The governing bodies for sport. Um, Generally, in my, in my experience, they often fear a lot, so they'll fear doing or saying the wrong thing. Um, sometimes it's more structurally there in the sense that, oh, why do we have to do it their way? Let's just do it the way we've always done. So there's just a general lack of understanding. Um, and the work that we do, you know, I've got projects, a couple of projects going on in Bradford and Ilford right now uh, with Muslim women in particular, looking at engaging them in badminton, in swimming, in running, um, and all this kind of stuff. And it just needs to be done. Um, so that people learn and then take that with them uh, beyond. In terms of a career within sport, you know, we, we just need more and more women coming out. So we've got Annie Zaidi, who's a fantastic coach uh, from Coventry, doing some amazing stuff, winning awards. Um, you know, we've got uh, Mariam Amatullah, who's a bike ride leader in Leicester. We've got Dana Abdul Karim, who's the first hijab wearing Muslim woman to play rounders uh, for England. Um, you know, all this kind of stuff, we need, just need more and more of those role models uh, to come out so women, you know, that, that ask me questions like, can I actually have a career in sport? The answer is clearly going to be yes. Um, in terms of the, the, the point that, I want to call you uncle, sorry, um, <laughs> that, uh, that you made and, and the question that, that you asked, it's, it, for me personally, it, they're very similar. Um, I think it's very easy to look at, for example, cricket, look at Moen Ali, Adil Rashid, um, and, and other, for example, Asian men that have come in um, into, into the sport and say that, that we're okay. You know, we've got these players coming through. It's very easy to do that and say we haven't got a diversity problem. The fact is we have. Um, and I work um, day in, day out in the sports industry. And, you know, we've seen, for example, with the Kick It Out campaign um, that's been going for over 20 years, um, that it started off about racism, so it's anti-racism. Um, but it's become even greater. It's now about hatred and prejudice right across the board. Sports as a whole has done a good job with dealing with, with discrimination, uh, as you were talking about. But it's not the same as inclusion. Inclusion is about representation. It's about having people in the boardrooms, in executive decision-making positions, in coaching, in uh, refereeing, in, in all of these areas of sport, and we just do not see the diversity. Think about taking the cricket as an example. Think about the number of Asians that play, men pl that play cricket up and down the country every single weekend. And I can't for a second think that there aren't more than two players that can make it into the England team. I also don't think that there's not one coach from the Asian community that can make it into the setup of cricket as a coach in that setup. Similarly in football, we see now there's a real push to get more opportunities for black managers. A lot of ex players that are black, the likes of Jason Roberts, are really pushing for this because they are qualified to the rafters in terms of you know, all the badges that they need, but they are not being given the opportunity because it's a closed system. I see that in football, and just to clarify, although I'm on the FA Council, I'm not an FA representative, um, I'm very much looking from the outside in, and from my perspective, um, there are barriers placed, and I'll give one example within I won't say which sport, but a particular board, um, which is dealing with women's, uh, that particular sport's women's arm. It's a new board and I'd been pushing for them, it's an all white board at the moment, I'd been pushing for them to have someone from an ethnic minority to go onto that board. Two people came forward, one was from an ethnic minority, one was another white woman. 
um, and they chose the white woman, um, even though the role of this person was to represent minority communities. So you can see straight away that there are serious issues about, um, you know, and by the way, they were both as qualified, so it wasn't to do with their race necessarily, but the idea is how qualified is that individual to represent minority communities, and that, you know, that to me spoke volumes. Um, so these kind of things happen all the time, and inclusion is a longer journey, it's an attitudinal change, um, and it's a change in the decision-making levels, and that, that needs to happen quickly because more and more people are getting frustrated. Can I just, can you know, is it, would, a, would a Rooney rule help, in your opinion? Um, yes, something similar to that. Um, I mean, obviously, you, the example of obviously the US and the NFL, um, for those that, that aren't aware of the Rooney rule, um, it was brought in by one of the, the owners of an NFL franchise um, because of the lack of, you know, the, something like 80% of players in the NFL were, were black, but they weren't being given the same opportunities in coaching. Um, and so this rule basically says that um, when a club uh, puts uh, interviews for, for, a, for a head coach or, or a coach position within, um, within the club, um, they will interview at least one minority candidate. Um, whether that candidate gets the job or not is another issue, but you know, there's a whole process around feedback and all that kind of stuff. So in football, I can talk from the football perspective because I'm only aware that it's happening there. Um, we are actually talking about this right now. Um, and there's uh, a similar rule that's, that's, that's going to hopefully come into place very soon, um, which will basically do the same thing. So whereas candidates wouldn't have had the opportunity to even put themselves in front of a panel, they will now have the opportunity to do that. So that's work in progress, but hopefully that will be happening soon. I wanted to get to the, the, the point of what I was trying to get to with that question which I would like to hear more on, actually, since you've raised it, was, was about the extent to which the actions that Ariana took were clearly a political statement about an ongoing uh, climate in the United States in which, uh, you know, the African Americans feel that there is, um, and there is, an unjust, broader system, institutionalized racism. Now, when a player chooses to prostrate on the pitch, is that in any way, I, I'm not necessarily seeing that as a parallel action, and I'm not seeing it as a political act as such. It's politicized by virtue of the climate, but is it actually a form of resistance? I mean, personally, I don't, I don't think that the prostration or you know, raising your hands to make a prayer is necessarily a political statement. I think, as Imran said earlier, I think people identify you in that way. You know. If, if a Christian player comes onto the pitch, you know, I was at Anfield on, on Tuesday evening and Jordan Ibe came on and he, he drew the cross and, and he walked onto the, and he came onto the pitch. And, you know, that's something that, that people just do. It's just a natural part of who they are. But I think it's the current climate that I, it just gets blown out of proportion in, sen in the sense of that identity. But I do agree with, with what you're saying. I think that there is a really positive role that can be played, but the idea of it being enforced on someone is something I'm uncomfortable with. I think it has to be a personal choice that you do that. Now, Ariana's case, that was a very, very strong political statement that she made, but one she felt that she had to do as a woman of color, a black woman, um, in the situation that she was in. And I think, um, you know, really ultimately, it, the personal choice element is, is the greatest bit, but we will as a community, I think, because of the climate, again, hold on to you know, Muslim athletes that we see because it's kind of like, it, it's a positive in our life. I think it's very easy for us to, to sit, sit here and say Muslim football players, both male and female, should go out and take the baton of, of Islam, the flag of Islam, and say, you must represent. Come on, guys, give, a, give, them, give them a break. I mean, you're talking about people who are in the industry because they've worked pretty much 90% of their life focused on this goal to become the best in their field. That is, the, that is their, their main rationale. Their main rationale isn't to go on BBC or Sky News or Fox News to talk about Islam and Sharia law and Donald Trump's you know, ludicrous remarks and comments, no. However, and this is very important, the social capacity which these players hold is immense. And we've seen these in cases like 
um, uh, um, Abtahaj, Muhammad Ali, um, Dembaba, for instance, and, and there are many. But that goes for Muslims, non-Muslims, just people in the public eye, people, people in, the public, um, in, in the public domain. I mean, if you, have, if you look at, for instance, um, Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo, you have many kids. Let's say if Ronaldo decided to dye his hair red, you will get a lot of kids doing the same thing the next day because they look up to Cristiano Ronaldo, they see him as a role model, they want to you know, try and Im imitate him as much as possible. And if you see that, that capacity that you have as, as a potential ambassador, a diplomat, you are, you know, you are carrying not only yourself, you're, he, I mean, Ronaldo is, is, a, is an iconic figure in Portugal, not only in Real Madrid, but he, he, he is sent on state visits to promote cultural tourism in Portugal. Likewise with David Beckham. If you remember the Olympics, who was part, who was part of the Olympic bid? We had Prince William as, 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 uh, from the royal family. We also had David Beckham, Seb Coe for the Olympics. So these are, these are very much influential figures and public figures who can gorge that attention with the audience. But to suggest that every single Muslim player to counter the anti-Muslim narrative which exists in the media is a bit far-fetched. I understand your point, definitely, and I agree with you in terms of the social capacity. However, but even that social capacity, if you have a, a Muslim player constantly talking about you know, the beauty of Islam and Islam is peace every single day, but they're sitting on the bench and not scoring goals, give it a break. You know, you're here, we're paying you a salary to score goals and win trophies, not to be some sort of preacher in, uh, in addressing rooms. I think they, they must, I mean, they, uh, in terms of advising them to be conscious of their actions, by all means. But I, I think I still, I still, I still feel that um, expecting them to, to become ambassadors and diplomats for the Islamic faith, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very tough position to be put in. I don't think many of us here would be, would be willing to put, our, put ourselves forward, you know, given the, the media attention that we have. And especially, for, I, mean, I mean, sports people. I remember, I remember the case where a PR guru was on, was on radio and they asked him, what, would, what is your advice on, on having sports people um, making political messages? And he said, look, from a PR perspective, from a marketing perspective, it's all good when they do it hush-hush down the corridor, but when they're doing it on a podium, taking a medal, that is very, very, very bad for us because Nike and Adidas will come calling, pull out their deals, and it's, it's bad for the, for, the, for, the, for the nation if they're playing in the Olympics, and there are many, many repercussions here. So I think, again, if you have that capacity, where do you execute that capacity, and are you willing to take on that responsibility as well? Just, just to add um, to that, because I think an important point's also been raised, if you take the Muslim part out of it, I mean, the, the, the fact that these Muslim footballers, for example, go into prostration or, or they make a, a, a prayer before, before coming on, or as Emre Jan was doing the other day, making it while the penalties were going on, um, you know, it was, it, it's one of those situations where I think even if they don't speak out in public about it, it's, the fact that they've done it sends a message in itself. It's a visual, it's there. Um, so I think that, personally, that's a positive thing. But I think Omar is an important point in what you're saying as well. Because there's a discussion going on right now in the rugby world with the new England rugby captain. Um, nothing to do with the Muslim community, obviously. Um, but he's renowned to be really dirty on the pitch. Um, you know, really, like, I mean, rugby's a contact sport, but pretty awful in terms of the bans that he's had over the years. And the discussion that's being had about that is, well, are sports people role models? They're there to play rugby. Why are they made into sports role models? In the yeah, sports, and that brings well. out, yeah. So it brings out a huge, you know, another kind of question around: these are sports people first, female athletes. They're athletes. They're not female athletes. It, it, you know, straight away, that's that's the first foundation that you build on. And then, like I say, it's that personal choice as to whether they want to go beyond that. Um, the, uh, so I, I want to be frank because this is this is an honest discussion. I think. If, if we're here sitting thinking, you know, the Muslims uh, have got it bad in sports and, you know, we're not, not doing as much, etc., that's very, very, very weak of us. Um, and we can't be naive, what I'm saying. I mean, there are clearly there's two sides to the coin. And I think what Rimla is saying from an institutional level, 100%, there is big, ma massive discrimination and lack of opportunity, be it on a coaching level, even the, the, the sector itself, football. You know, if you want to enter the sector and you want to be, you know, I want to enter football, you can so you can do so without becoming a football player. There are many other opportunities within this within this uh, field. But having said that, I think there was a point about Mares and Vardy. Vardy is talked about because he broke the Premier League consecutive goals 
a, 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 you know, a, a pedestal. So he knocked on Van Nistelrooy. That's why he's being talked about. Mares, I mean, in terms of he's not being talked about as much, I'm sorry, but I think, I mean, I don't know what, what your sources are, but I see Mares being talked about quite, quite a lot, um, given the fact that, you know, irrespective of his faith or where he comes from, I can, I can say that from my, from, my, from my experience. Now, with regards to the, the community, it's not a question which I'm addressing in my research, but it's one often which I keep, keep on getting asked. That is, why are we not seeing British Muslim, or British Asian in particular, actually, not even British Muslim, but British Asian players, British Asian Muslim players is the second sub-question in, in the Premier League. Now, there are a number of reasons, and I can't sit here and say it's because of one reason, because there isn't a, w one reason. There are many, many number of variables which we have to consider. For those who say, they don't make it because they eat curry is completely ridiculous. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, um, and this is, a, by the way, this is actually a, a legitimate, you know, well, not a legitimate, but actually uh, many, many answers you, you'll come across uh, people who, which will they will raise. Maybe, I don't know if they happen in the FA boardroom, but I hope not. If they do, then we understand why we're not getting the opportunities. Um, but we have that, but we also have all Asian leagues and all, um, um, uh, African leagues and all Middle East and all Arab leagues, all Turkish leagues and North London, for instance. That doesn't help if you want to break into the scene. So, for instance, the gentleman here who said, I don't believe in a system, I gave up. I disagree. I think you should carry on. Pick it up again and carry on and see where that takes you. I think that attitude of saying that we don't believe in a system is quite defeatist already. So if you're setting up an argument to say that, you know, we're not getting opportunities, but then there's one presented to you and you're saying, well, I don't want to take it on. I mean, football players never, they didn't get where, where they are today because they just you know, woke up one day and got lucky. You know, there is some element of luck, but it's a lot of hard work as well. So I think, you know, with, with respect to um, you know, the Muslim community, I think there needs to be work done in terms of you know, sh playing in all county leagues. That's where you get the scouts in the FA seeing you, and actually you have scouts from the FA picking you up, your name gets called, ex this agent speaks to this agent, then you're exposing yourself much better. Now, the point made by, I think it's Amar, very valid point, and it goes back to the idea of, of public diplomacy in many ways. You know, having that social capacity as an individual, as a governing body, or as a nation state, does not mean you're going to automatically achieve positive recognition or positive uh, public perception. On the contrary, it's a, it's, a, it's a swinging pendulum. If you get it wrong, it's really, really bad. It's really, really bad. And I can, I actually can, you know, in the case of Russia, for instance, Brazil recently, we saw what happened in FIFA, the amount of people protesting. There were people who are not seeing this, this equal distribution, equal of, you know, the, the wealth distribution was, was, you know, discriminatory in many ways. And I think it's very important that we have this nuanced argument um, from a top level and also from a, from a bottom level. Otherwise, if we already have this attitude, you know, we're not going to have that player who's going to be playing for England and, um, and winning the World Cup. Um. Yeah, as, a, as an Asian, the only Asian male on the panel, um, who aspire to be a footballer. Still do, actually. I'm 39, but not, not giving up hope just yet. Um, yeah, I'd like to echo some of the words of... Um, I'd like to disagree so we could have a big scrap up here, but, you know, we're just going to agree. Um, there's lots of Asian players who are currently being scouted. Um, uh, my son uh, being one of them. Uh, a little while back, he was released at the age of eight by Manchester United. As a Liverpool fan, that was interesting. Um, he didn't have to wear the kit. It was just a red top without the badge. Um, West Brom currently have three brothers who are on their books, and then the B brothers. Um, actually, one's just moved to Peterborough, uh, who was playing in the Indian Premier League, and then he moved back to Peterborough. The other two are at West Brom. Um, you know, Liverpool have uh, Indian origin, player Yolanda, I think it is, uh, on the book. So, you know, uh, football's a sport, right? And it's, it makes no commercial sense whatsoever to discriminate. You know, even if you, even if you have it within you to discriminate, you know, if you're going to find an Indian origin player, can you imagine how many shirts you're going to sell? You know, it's, it's, hu it's a huge commercial opportunity, right? So I, I can't see that. I've got to agree on the Mahrez thing as well. I mean, Okay, fine, we understand the backstory of Vardy, but he's British, right? So, yeah, we might have... I mean, weirdly, if I'm thinking about who I'd, whose backstory I'd want to hear about more, me personally, I... I Mahrez. Because I think in football terms, I, you know, I've watched non-league, I've watched 
you know, Division Two Premier League, you know, identify with that whole journey. That's more interesting to me than, okay, maybe he's, you know, Mahrez has come from another country and he was knocking about on the streets and then somebody picked him up and he made it through. You know, so maybe it's just a case of people are just more interested in the backstory of, of, of Vardy. I've completely forgotten the other questions. <laughs> There was one about um, British about players versus people. foreign players, mm. Mm. Yeah. and then another one about the Muslim Tyson Fury, which is quite an image. Mm. Yeah, I was trying to think, do we have anything close to a Muslim Tyson Fury yeah, at the moment? Yeah, we do, but I'm not going to say his name. No, go, go on, go on, give us the initials. A. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Uh, do people still identify Mike Tyson as, 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 as a Muslim? Um, he look, does. He does? Yeah. He identifies as Muslim. Okay. Uh, doesn't he have a bit of a reformation? Anyway. Uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> he is what he is. Um, yeah. Sorry, just to add in, no, that's interesting. Um, with the, I, I, again, I, I'm sorry, I have to agree with the whole Vardy and, and Mara's situation. I think um, what's more interesting for me is actually in terms of hype and forget, forgetting, you know, having memories that are very short in terms of Vardy's journey. More recently, in terms of some of the incidents that he was involved with, everyone's forgotten about that. That's more interesting for me than the Mar you know, Mara's body thing. Um, but yeah, just the, the two points that were made at the top. I think, um, as I said earlier on, certainly with female Muslim athletes, one of the biggest issues is um, we are judged by our outer form. Um, and in Sanya's case, um, and that's both with our, within our community and, and outside of it. So in Sanya's case, obviously within the community, it was a case of you know, she's not covering. Um, that's her personal choice, but you're right. That has a negative impact in terms of potentially, particularly Indian uh, young girls growing up and, and whether that's an acceptable um, acceptable thing for them. I think um, we're, we're actually seeing a real movement for Muslim women in sport right now, but that movement's coming from within themselves. Um, so here in, in the UK, we have um, the British atomweight Muay Thai champion, who I'm pretty sure most people haven't heard of, Rukhsana Begum. Um, you know, no, nobody really talks about her. She doesn't cover, um, but she's at the same time, she recognises that young Muslim girls need a role model to look up to. Um, and they also need clothing that's appropriate for them if, if, they, if they choose to cover. She's just, um, you know, designed her own sports hijab. So for her... She can still be, you know, positively promoting sports for, for, uh, for young Muslim girls, even though she doesn't cover herself. And also, you know, she talks quite openly about the fact that she hid the fact that she was training uh, in Muay Thai kickboxing for a number of years from her family. Now they're on board, but she had to go through that journey herself. So I think that's a natural part of a female Muslim athlete's journey. Um, but, you know, I mentioned Ibtihaj Hajj earlier on who's very open, you know, about her identity and, and what it means to her. You've also got the likes of um, Indira Kaljo, a Bosnian-American, uh, Bilqis Abdul Qadir, who played ball with the president, I think, with Obama, actually. Um, but the two of them together, African-American and, and Bosnian-American, have taken on FIBA, the, the basketball version of FIFA, because they too have banned the hijab. Um, and they want to play internationally, and they can't because the hijab's been banned. You've got um, Kulsum Abdullah, who's a Pakistani-American weightlifter, who um, wanted to wear the hijab whilst uh, weightlifting, but the International Weightlifting Federation wouldn't let her, so she had to take them on. There's a theme, as you can see. You know, there's constantly barriers that Muslim women are having to overcome, and particularly the ones that, that do cover. I think in terms of um, the idea of the, the Asians, in, in, in not just in football, but I think right across sport, it's not just a football problem. It's, it's a problem, in, you know, I mentioned cricket earlier on, but it's, it's right across the board. Um, we talked, Amar, you talked about the, the movement for, for women in sport. It, it's for, if I can be frank, it's for white women in sport. If you look at the England women's cricket team, the England women's football team, the England women's uh, rugby team, the, the World Cup winners, if you look at all of that, it's a particular demographic. So women's sport is very behind when it comes to diversity. But on the male side, I think in terms of participation from grassroots through to amateur sort of semi-pro level, you've got a good representation there. But like Omar said, um, if you don't actually integrate into the mainstream leagues, you're not going to get talent spotted. Um, 
you know, I know I've in in West uh, in West Ham that area. I've I've spoken to different groups, and some people say it's institutional racism. They just don't want our people. They do think it's because we eat curry that that we we're not going to be fit enough. And those stereotypes do actually exist. Um, and you know, on the other hand, you've got people that run um, academies for for young, particularly Bengali. Uh, kids who say that you know the parents just aren't committed enough to to keep driving them to training or, or that kind of stuff so the argument is twofold we don't see enough you know we see more and more black players British black players coming through in football therefore parents that have black children will say my child can also do that right now we don't have enough British born Muslim athletes, Asian athletes across the UK, and therefore parents cannot see that that is a realistic career for their for their child. Um, so it is a twofold argument, uh, and that's the reality of the situation. And I think that it's going to take, you know, a number of years before that changes. We've got another round of questions. I just had it on the sort of my two pennies on the uh, Vardy Myers conversation. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm up from the platform. I'm allowed. Um, Myers has missed two penalties in last week. They would be top of the league by four points if Myers had scored them. Um, let me uh, start with uh, Mohammed's uh, question. So the, the question on um, grassroots and how the impact of, of these actions on a grassroots level. Um, if you remember, there was a documentary on the, the, Mus the Muslim Premier League on BBC. And I believe it was Colin Murray who was the, the narrator. And he actually uh, was, was, uh, picked the example of uh, kids in a local park in Newcastle dropping to their knees and doing a prostration. So we've seen this you know, become part of popular culture, which is fascinating because we've seen this not only people you know, in real life doing it, but we also pe we see this in, in, in computer games. So for those of you who are football fanatics and have a copy of the FIFA game, you know, you can actually make the player prostrate after scoring a goal. That was non-existent five years ago. So you can see here the, the appropriation and the cultural appropriation to popular culture that we see many kids talking about prostration. We see many kids doing it. We see many people uh, raising their hands before a game. You know, I'll be honest, when I was growing up and playing football, I, used to, I actually used to put my collar up like Cantona. You know, that was, the, that was, and everyone I think growing up in the 80s and 90s would remember, you know, before doing any, especially a penalty kick, it was always the collar up. So that part of, was part of popular culture, the king, you know, King Eric. Um, and and then we see the same today. We see the same today. You know, Demba being talked about prostrating. We, and, and, it's, and that is very important. We can't measure it uh, in terms of the impact because it's, it's quite soft. It's, 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 you know, the social capacity that one has, they have a very short window in terms of transferring that. And, and most of the time, it's after scoring a goal. For instance, if you can imagine Dembaba scoring a goal after he concedes their own goal, most of the fans will be booing him. I mean, otherwise there'll be something wrong. I mean, that comes at a moment of success, of winning. And I think, you know, in terms of theory, we have um, Pierre Bordeaux who talks about social capacity. And he actually mentions that there is a short window here for the, the ability to be recognized is to achieve recognition. So if you're trying to, you know, impose recognition on others without actually achieving recognition, then you don't have the ability, you don't have the, the social capacity to do so. So I think that has, has played a significant role in maybe uh, initiating a conversation. And I think that goes the same thing with football players. Football players, you know, there's a case, I won't mention the name, where a child um, was asked to, to pray by a football player. Um, and only after the football player told the child, you should listen to your uncle, I believe it was, you should pray, the kid started to pray. So there is, they're more receptive in this particular case to hear from a role model. They look at him and think, wow, this is a massive player. I should listen to him. And there's a thin line here between taking the words of a football player and everything that a football player says and believing in that. I think the, the key connection here is, is, the, is the initiating the conversation and then introducing them to someone of, of knowledge about their faith, for instance. So, and this is where they, they, they have that impact on a grassroots level. The, the Qatar question, you're right, it's the first Muslim majority country that will be hosting the World Cup. Um, the issue that Muslims are not involved in sports, I think that is a question we can easily, you know, uh, defragmentate and actually look at the case of Manchester City. If you look at the El Clasico, one of the biggest derbies on this planet between Real Madrid and, and Barcelona, what are the two main things that really come to your face? Qatar Airways and Flight Emirates. 
Who would have thought you would see two global multinational corporations like Qatar Airways and Fly Emirates sponsoring El Clasico? You know, and, and, that, and that says a lot in terms of the power of, of, of media, the power of, of business, and the fact that we have millions, if not billions of pounds being spent in the sporting industry by not only the Qatari family, which we see through um, uh, investing in PSG, which they own Paris Saint-Germain, but they also have, as I, as I mentioned, Qatar Airways um, sponsoring Barcelona. Uh, we have the Emirati family, the ruling family in Abu Dhabi actually uh, have bought and funding Manchester City Football Club. Um, and they are sponsored by Etihad Airways, Arsenal and Fly Emirates again, their stadium is called the Emirates Stadium. So even language is very important here when we appropriate language as well to the idea of, 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 of these power structures. You know, when a commentator says, welcome to the Etihad Stadium, welcome to the, Fly, to the Emirates Stadium, you know, that's, it's, 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 it plays a magnificent role in terms of the power of sport and the, and the globalization of sport. And even with the context of language, we refer back to Muslim women, why is the, the Premier League for, for women called the Women's Premier League? And the, the male Premier League is called the Premier League. And why is the FA called the FA, not the English FA? So even like with language, a very subtle you know, um, uh, appropriation with language as well, that how we, you know, the F FIFA Women's World Cup, not the FIFA World Cup as well. So it's sort of like, you're not quite there yet. You're not, you don't meet the, the elite or tournament. You're, you're still a woman. You don't partake as much as, as good as us. However, I would argue, if you wanted a role model who um, can beat, combat any stereotype with, with, with Islam in, in particular, I would say someone like um, Annie Zaidi does a hell of a lot more than all the male football players, Muslim football players put together. Because that, the hijab she wears is already politicized, whether she likes it or not. Whether she actually steps on the football, football pitch or not. Um, and the idea of symbolic power, again, we talk about this in terms of prostrating. Demba Bauli does that within 10 seconds. Annie Zaidi has the headscarf throughout, throughout her session, her football session. So her impact is far, far greater than Demba Bauli, I would argue. But, yeah, we'll leave that. Yeah, I think um, just in terms of uh, the, the point that you made back there, I mean, I'm not sure if I understood it fully, so correct me if I'm wrong, but there are a number of Asian players, British Asian players, that are in um, kind of the semi-pro level, and they don't make it through to, to you know, the, the pro level. And for me, there's got to be an issue there, because, again, I can't for a second believe that there's not at least one that's, that's good enough to make it through. Um, I think, really, for, from my perspective, I mean, you, you raised a good uh, point there, Omar, around the whole women's... In, in America, um, they've got something, a legislation called Title IX, which basically allows... Uh, which, which enforces, I guess, because it's legislation, um, that you have to split the, the funding that goes into everything that goes into women's sport and men's sport equally. Um, and what that's actually resulted in, in terms of the research that's come out of that, is that um, people don't refer to it as women's soccer or men's soccer. They just refer to it as soccer. Um, so I think wording is, is really important in terms of, of how we go forward with that, yeah. I think that also speaks to um, the commercial drivers of this. You know, you can legislate or regulate certain aspects of any industry, any governance structure, and if to um, encourage spending, and you know, this is sort of a neoliberal management lecture. But if you have that imperative, and it's enforceable by you know law in this case, or in the case of the, the NFL, you know, the equal distribution of funds or in terms of the NCAA in, uh, in American college sport, they are, they, these are bodies that, you know, get that, the funding is, you know, equitable, so to speak, um, although obviously, you know, certain sports have more funds than others. And one of the more interesting things, I think, there in terms of discrimination and non-inclusion is, you know, the biggest American college sport is American football, which is a just a male sport. You know, the, the, um, you know, final four weekend, women's uh, basketball, men's basketball, just basketball. But actually, the single biggest driver of that industry that allows men's and women's basketball or volleyball or other soccer um, to take place is a male-only sport. I think that, you know, there's an inherent tension there in as it, one is a facilitator of another. And if we're happy to reconcile that on a gender basis, is that something that can be reconciled in other um, sort of, uh, aspects of identity in this 
in this regard. On, on that point, sorry, Osama, the, the idea of revenue, I think is important. If you look at the halal market goods industry globally, it, it stands at the moment over $500 billion per year. So that is that market industry for halal goods. We're talking about non-alcoholic beverages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and halal food. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is because you look at the case of uh, Formula One in Bahrain, for instance, you know, the, the, the champagne ceremony, that is actually non-alcoholic, but it may appear it is actually um, um, alcoholic beverage, but it isn't. So for sure, it seems like it was just a standard beverage, but we, need to, we must appease you know, the, the, the Bahrain government because they are investing, they are sponsoring the, the Formula One, bringing it into, 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 onto their shores. So it's important that the Muslim, the, the Muslim woman even, is seen as a body. So a body where they can actually see it as a, a potential commercial asset. And the reason why I mention is because the, the, the hijab uh, market, for instance, believe you me, given maybe a few years, Nike will turn up and say, well, here's a sports hijab. Because we've seen a market, a halal, the halal goods market, at 500, over 500 billion per year, $500 billion per year. We can you know, infiltrate that sort of market and then have the Muslim woman pretty much seen as a body. It is anyway done by, you know, by, by, you know, if we look at female athletes, you know, if you look at walking to a Nike store 20 years ago, you wouldn't see a woman's department as big as it is today, for instance. And we have, we have these new shoes, new colors, et cetera, and, and specific um, uh, gear for, 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 for females and males. And now we're seeing that also, that appropriation for the, for the Muslim women, not, I would argue, not on, on an equality basis, but more on a, on a, on a commercial, commercial basis for, for multinational corporations, of course. They see that as an incentive. Yeah, I think um, there's, there's, no, there's no hiding away from it. At the end of the day, sport is business. And um, I mean, I think it was about seven, eight years ago, Speedo actually came up to us to trial their burkinis um, because they'd just come out in Australia and they wanted to, to get in on the market. So, you know, that kind of stuff's there. I mean, the number of sports hijabs that are out there, the number of sort of modest clothing, as they call it, it it's, it's a growing business. But I think it also speaks back to the, the politicization of sport as well, actually. Um, and I, I remember back um, during the Olympics when there was the, in here, here in London, when there was this huge movement to force all the countries, every single country must have a female representative. And clearly it went straight to Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, I think it was the two countries that were refusing to, to send female athletes. And in the end, um, I can certainly remember from the, from the Saudi side, we had, two, uh, we had a judoka and uh, a runner from, from America actually that had uh, links to Saudi that, that ended up being part of the team. But what I found interesting is a research piece that was done about a year or two ago about the coverage of female Muslim athletes, those that covered and those that didn't as well. Um, and how it, again, it relates back to this obsession that the world seems to have with the outer form of a Muslim woman, whether she covers or not, and what that means on the sports field. So. This piece of research highlights all of that stuff, um, and it talks about how female athletes, particularly Muslim athletes from Russia, female athletes from Russia that do gymnastics, they don't cover. They, you know, they they weren't talked about in any other form other than their ability in their field of play, whatever it was. But when it came to the likes of Sarah Attar and and others. Um, that were there from Saudi, etc. It was all about the fact that they were covered, the fact that, you know, there was a whole argument of whether the judoka would be able to actually compete because they weren't allowing her to wear the hijab and then there was this whole kind of political process. What I found even more interesting was not every country actually sent a woman. There were countries that were non-Muslim countries that didn't send female athletes, but nobody highlighted that. And I think that just comes back to the narrative that is constantly given about Muslims and Muslim countries and how it is politicized. And at the end of the day, that's a narrative that's going to be there. And we just need to use our power and counter that narrative in the best way possible through, I personally, I believe, through our athletes, the like of Annie, I agree. You know, her being out there on the grassroots, as Mo was saying earlier on, being out there on the grassroots level and actually, you know, the, the sexism, the racism, these, you know, anti-Muslim hatred that she's had to deal with. And it's just her pure passion for coaching that has pulled her through. Um, you know, she's, she's stood up to it all. And she's sent out an even posit more positive message than anyone else can if they just preached about Islam by just being there and sticking it out and, and just being an amazing coach.
Thank you. Well, uh, I think on that note, we're going to thank you all here on the panel for your contribution. So if you could join me in thanking them.